It's December the 21st, I'm Chris, this is Henry, and this is Curiously Polar. Yeah, it's the Christmas episode. Hey, jingle, jingle. Ho, ho, ho. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, now I can't. I, I have to I have to type in my password because I'm wearing this mask. <laughs> Hold on. Here we go. It's the. <laughs> that was kind of anticlimactic. Was, Let me take this yeah. off. Let me take this off. Um, oh. Oh. We are in the Arctic today, aren't we? Uh, no, we're actually everywhere. Polar regions. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's warm in here. <laughs> but it's warmer than anticipated. <laughs> but if you're in the Arctic uh, or in the Antarctic, um, anywhere in the polar regions, that's the kind of gear you want. Even though that's is Russian, <laughs> the things we're wearing, we, we have been wearing is Russian. Hey, welcome back to Curiously Polar. We are, um, yeah, we 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 are we are pulling a few things together for Christmas for you. Uh, it's not the last episode this year. There's one more to come a bit later in the year. I think on the 29th. But um, yeah, this is our festive episode. And um, <laughs> now that uh, click, yep, oh no, as, as easy as you get rid of snow. Um, Global warming. <laughs> uh, we have a few things to uh, that we want to follow up on and. We have uh, a few Christmassy things to talk about. So but let's, let's start with the recaps. Yeah, let's see what, what has happened in the world because things have happened. And the first thing, I believe, is about a big chunk of ice. Exactly. Like my most favorite topic of all, and that's this big iceberg, A68A. And a few episodes ago, we talked about um, the iceberg uh, on a collision course with uh, South Georgia and the threat of it um, running aground and just blocking the channels, um, supply channels for uh, seals and penguins. And actually, the iceberg just grounded very briefly, or let's say it rather bumped onto the shelf. And what happened there, we can see actually on the world, uh, world view monitor on the video version of it is that a uh, a slightly smaller chunk broke off the tip of the iceberg, if you like, just broke off. Still 150 small. square kilometers in small. area, exactly. <laughs> so we have to say small um, in brackets, 150 of course. square kilometers, yeah, okay. That's so, so on the play. On the picture, on the video uh, version, what you see is South Georgia at the top, and then below that, under the clouds, uh, you can see the, the iceberg with the big chunk on the top and if we go back a few days um yeah the clouds are a bit distracting but you, you get an idea how it moves and how it okay so it comes in from the left and it's moving forward and then it's rotating here, with the current and there is actually here is where where this breaks off this was on the yeah some some time a few days ago where i think it, on the 17th it just um and it broke off the now, shelf and now that big chunk is well <laughs> is now free to move to wherever <laughs> the the currents carry it. So you have to to remember the thickness or the the, the draft of the iceberg is 160 meters below uh, the water level. So it just touched the ground of the continental shelf somewhere there, and now it um yeah drifts a little bit away from the shelf, where it just got picked up um, by the cur uh, currents and. Hopefully, then just got um, your lat around the southeastern tip of South Georgia. And the BBC actually just posted uh, some pictures here, some, some close-ups on their website. You can find that link in the show notes, um, where there is, again, just a visualization of that piece that broke off, which looks even smaller on that uh, picture from the 17th. But still, 150 square grounded. kilometers, that should give you an idea how big this whole thing is. Not, not that we haven't said this before and <laughs> emphasized how big it is, but it is big, okay. It, it certainly is, yeah. When you scroll uh, down on that page, you might even uh, get an aerial view of it. Uh, they can see- yeah, Oh, the motion just here, the, yeah. Exactly, the topography, the, the, the move of the iceberg uh, over the past days, and when it actually um yeah sat ground or just bumped into the shelf and they can see out of the window of the airplane of the royal air force um video of the iceberg 
That's pretty amazing. It is, yeah. Anyway, so we have uh, a chunk. We we lost, or the, the iceberg lost a bit of ice. It's actually large enough that it gets its own number. So it's um, A68D delta. Not just is there, is there like a, a threshold after which you get your own number? or There up? is a, th a threshold. I'm not sure what it actually is. I uh, would have to look that up. And that's when, instead of calling you an ice cube, they will call you an iceberg. <laughs> exactly, kind Possibly. of. Possibly. Okay, a second follow-up we have is the Sevmorput, the ship oh, that lost, yes, our that lost most, a blade of its propeller. Our most favorite exploration ship. It's, okay, so this story is getting even crazier. So well, let's, let's recap. The Sevmorput was on the way... That a Russian nuclear-powered ship on the way to uh, the Antarctic to as, on a supply mission. And there were icebreakers already on the way to clear the way for the Sevmorput. And then the, it lost uh, somewhere next to Africa. It lost a blade of its four-blade propeller. And then they sent divers down there to cut off the opposite blade so it wouldn't vibrate, which makes perfect sense. And uh, last week we didn't really know where it was because, uh, well, we knew where it was because the marine traffic.com uh, gives us this, <laughs> this information, but we didn't know it was if it was going forward or backward. And now something new has happened. Indeed. So just news broke uh, down uh, the other day uh, reporting that the Submoport just passing by the Canary Islands almost passed it already just sent out a distress signal for an emergency for a medical emergency okay stating, wait medical emer not not a propeller loss emergency a medical e emergency Exactly. We have to say that the, the carrier is already under uh, close um, supervision. So authorities of both Spain, where the Canary Islands belong to, and Morocco, which is um, on the uh, eastern side of um, the Canary Islands, have been um, yeah supervising the, the uh, carrier very closely because it decided to rather run the very highly frequented channel between uh, the Canary Islands and Morocco rather than going onto the open sea and just uh, take the less frequented uh, route there. But then a medical emergency was just called and that was actually dealing with the captain's health. So the, the captain apparently needed to be evacuated. So two helicopters were sent out. One took the captain on board and flew him to Las Palmas and uh, Gran Canary. And uh, apparently needed to be evacuated with meningitis, which is highly infectious. So the first officer took over control and just continues um, heading north. So it hasn't uh, changed the itinerary so or the route at all. We do have the marine traffic location. It's in it's outside Portugal next to Spain Yeah, it just headed right further north now. You can see the Canary Islands further south. Um, and it's and it's and moving back towards Saint Petersburg, where it's uh, indeed where its uh, home harbor is. Interesting uh, in this article on Polo Journal is um, well, not just a picture of the ship, but a bit <laughs> further down, uh, an actual photo of the propeller of the Sevmorput, which I found very interesting because um, you can see the four blades that was apparently before one broke off, um, but you can also see this. Um, almost like a tube around the propeller. So it's not an open propeller, but it has a fencing around it to protect it from ice, I guess. Yeah, it's exactly. That's just like a protection for um, uh, a ship which is going into uh, icy waters. So you have a protection shield uh, around it. So it's not okay. only blocked by the rudder, but also by the shield surrounding the, um, the propeller. So how so they... That's there to the prevent big chunks of ice to breaking off blades. So the question is, how did that blade <laughs> come off? Yeah, that remains the mystery. And I'm, I'm really curious about the investigative report um, later on, if the public will actually see a result of that report. That would be really interesting. This is a really, a really exciting story towards the end of this year. Not not that 2020 <laughs> doesn't, hasn't thrown enough things at us, but... Is. But it actually is certainly not the year of the Samoport, that's for sure. 
Well, it's not it's not the year for many things. So <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> uh, let's just put this on the record. Um, but it is the year um, that ends like all the other years or many of the other years with a Christmas. So I think that's hopefully uh, a very special Christmas in those it, times. It, what 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 do you think is going to be special about this Christmas? Other than that, uh, some people are are gonna be celebrating it with with the others i think like regular christmas at least as far as i remember it when i was younger are um, more like family gatherings and yeah. in in the pandemic situation um being in the lockdown in, in a number of countries having a new mutation which is even more infectious um i think we see more smaller groups not visiting grandparents possibly and probably not having large family gatherings. For example, uh, here in Transylvania, we are very regulated. We're not allowed to meet with more than uh, six people. So there is no chance of uh, have you know, larger gatherings, mm. which probably changes Christmas tradition quite a lot. And traveling, for example, to visit um, parents-in-laws or something, which was kind of a tradition on the first uh, day of Christmas, you would just visit one uh, pair of parents, the other day of Christmas, uh, the other pair. So this kind of traveling probably would, won't happen this year. So there is a big change, I think. Okay. So let's see. What have you brought us here? Um, yeah, I would love to talk about uh, polar Christmas. So um, yeah. Christmas traditions have evolved um, in in cultures all around the globe and uh, also in the circum polar north um, where you actually have indigenous people and what you can see is that at a specific time of the year even though it's not the christian way of uh, celebrating christmas you have kind of a gathering where people are coming together and having a feast and that gathering uh, coincides with christian uh the christian version of christmas and that's no coincidence, of course. Um, it's rather that everybody celebrates kind of at the peak of winter, where you have winter solstices in the north and in the south, of course, uh, it's summer solstices at the same time. When Which is, by the you, way, today, it's the 21st of December when we're recording this. It is, so, uh, indeed. This is the shortest amount of daylight um, in the year. And after this, it's up again. Exactly. From today on, we are gaining daylight hours again, um, yeah, hours per day. And on this particular day, in the area north of the Arctic Circle, that's like the the darkest period. So you you don't really have plenty of, um, of opportunities to hunt to supply for food. So the winter was kind of a diet your period where you couldn't really feast you don't really have a, a lot to to uh, feast on but this particular day or this particular period around the uh, winter solstice around christmas time that was the time when we see people coming together and just celebrate a big feast where all the yummy uh, meals were just brought together put together or just you yeah, prepared and then actually just yeah feast on in large gatherings and when you remember the early explorers going into the arctic trying to to find the north pole or trying to find a way through the northwest passage or the northeast passage or wherever they went of course when you get stuck and you have to overwinter christmas is uh, still an important our time mm -hmm. and for those expedition leaders even more because around christmas you have the the period where it's the darkest so it's from a mood from a psychological perspective a very challenging year for the expedition staff for all the young men just going into the unknown not being able to spend their time with their loved ones probably with their partners um, and the families, of course. And that's the time when you actually think the most of them, when you can't do much, you can't move because you're locked in by the ice. And then it's the the duty of the expedition leaders to actually 
get the mood up, to lift it up somehow. So those family tradi uh, those Christmas traditions brought from civilization into the uh, expedition environment has played a huge role in motivating the crew and keeping the spirits up or lifting them up again and just bring them through out the dark period until the sun comes back in early January. So we see that for those purposes, the stock has already been late when setting up tradition, uh, when setting up um, the expedition itself. So we see in the supplies, in the provisions already um, certain ingredients to make a proper Christmas meal, a proper Christmas celebration. And that has changed quite a lot. But one thing we see, especially in the North, is something, um, yeah, the explorers learned from Northern American uh, natives, and that's a, a dish called pamican. And that's basically dried meat pre prepared together with boiled fat and that just you know, cooked together. It's a paste that gets very quickly solid. And this solid piece of meat slash fat is the highest possibility of, of containing um, prote uh, proteins and fat together. So it's kind of an energy bar for exactly you see here um here's a picture of it looks fairly <laughs> nice actually it reminds me a bit of a christmas pudding that i've seen in wales one year it is also quite similar to corned beef it's not ah, really okay. but it's something if you don't really have an idea it is something like that so actually the the meat usually it's um deer or it used to be bison, but bisons have been almost brought to the ash of extinction by hunting them down for pamican, actually. Um, those kind of meat would, would have been smoked or dried, and dried to, to a level that actually is breakable very easily. And this has been chopped into a powder, the meat. So you have a meat powder, and then you use a very dense uh, version of fat, so bear fat, for example, or even bison fat. This would have been boiled and this kind of fat um, you would have been used to mix into the uh, meat powder to make it stick together, to form a paste. And as soon as that fat would cool down, it would just solidify the whole pasture. And that would make like a block of, of you know, meat slash fat. And it's very important to, to find the right mixture of fat and meat. So it's not too fatty. It's not too um, too strong in the flavor, but strong enough to keep all of that together. And that piece, that pamican, that's just storable forever almost without any additional feature. You really don't need to cool it. You don't really need to process it. That was the way of the natives to make their meat last longer, last through the strong winter where they can't hunt for new ones. And the explorers have taken that. Actually, the Royal Navy has um, professionalized that, has canned that. And the pamican still was used on the Royal um, Marines and uh, Royal Army when they fought battles in South Africa. And of course, it has been a crucial part of polar expeditions. And when you have a celebration like Christmas, where you went through a period of really strict diet, then a feast with pamican turned into a soup, for example, a hooch, for example, that's just something really extraordinary. And you get a bunch of energy just with this one feast. That was a pretty amazing way of just getting things up. And this has not been only the case in the Arctic. Of course, the explorers then turned to the Antarctic and brought that in as well. And then we have some, some very famous explorers like Amundsen in 1912, who uh, yeah, reached for the South Pole and celebrated Christmas. And his Christmas was not that, um, yeah, much developed like it used to be years earlier when he went through the Northwest Passage. And we actually have a picture from the Christmas celebrations in the Northwest Passage. Yeah, here's a, here's a, here it is on a uh, page of the University of Cambridge and it's uh, from, from his book, The Northwest Passage. So 
Um, exactly. You'll get an idea of what this was like. Very, very staged photo, which I kind of understand because 1903, um, that's when the photo was apparently taken. The photography was still a very slow medium, so you'd have to sit very, very still for a long time. So that's why they are not smiling or anything on the photo. It's more like it's more like don't move, don't move, don't don't move, don't move for like several minutes. So um, I yeah. guess that's probably what's happening here. But yeah, you can see there's a, there's some candles there. Um, you know, is that is that Amundsen that the one who's very stern looking with the uh, with a with a costume on with a hood on with a hood yeah. on yes okay yes. and you can see that's that's really kind of a luxurious version of 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 Christmas they are sitting on board of Gyria of this ship he was sailing through the Northwest Passage that was just frozen in uh, at King Edward's Island uh, at King Williams Island sorry and. Um, the five of them just coming together. There's quite some decoration, a couple of candles, and of course also a different type of feast he had years later. 1912, when he was in Antarctica to reach the South Pole, um, he actually reached the South Pole in 1911. So on the 14th of December 1911. So on the way back from the South Pole, they just had the Christmas, and uh, Amundsen was describing it as basically taking all the remains of the biscuits and grinding that down to uh, yeah, powder, mixing that with some fat and just um, making kind of a Christmas porridge out of that. And that was kind of their uh, feast to get some, some energy and uh, yeah, to, to celebrate a special way. A year later in 1913, um, Mason, for example, he um, served an ounce of butter to each of the expedition uh, participants as kind of a celebration. That was a um, very distinct one. And then in uh, 1915, when Shackleton um, stranded on the ice with his crew, that was a completely different type of, of um, Christmas. And you would think it would be much simpler. The opposite was the case. They still had the supplies from the Endurance, so they had a huge feast with anchovies and oil baked beans judged hair there was really a big mixture of food a big feast which was of course not only to lift the mood but also to lower the weight to carry for the remaining participants of the expedition they needed to pass the ice to go towards elephant island so there was also, of course, um, a practical purpose to that feast. But you see, there are a number of different um, traditions or yeah, ways to deal with that. Scott was probably the one who took the traditions from the north down to the south. And he really had this kind of a, of a Christmas course, with the first course being pemmican, um, as just described. Um, with some slices of horse meat flavored with onion and curry powder, as he describes it in his... That sounds quite um, lovely, to be honest. It does. And Scott was one of the uh, forerunners of pemmican. He's that, that's, that's not supposed to miss on any polar expedition, probably the most important ingredient to a polar expedition. So he was really um, loving pemmican just for the sake of... Um, easy to store, you don't have to worry about that being uh, turning bad, and providing a lot of energy, a lot of proteins for the participants. So question to you, is pemmican something that you can still today, well, is it being still made? And that's the first question. Second question, if you are in the right location, could you just go to a store and buy some pemmican? I'm not sure about the store, but a number of pemmican recipes out there online. It's easy okay. to Google, and um, it still is a very important part of the diet of um, yeah natives uh, in northern Canada, for example. So you, you still find up to date recipes. It's if you go on a camping trip, it's an amazing piece of uh, provision you can take with you. It still is, and you can just flavor it. Um, your natives just. Um, used berries, um, put dried berries in there, like blueberries, uh, but also apricots, for example, and uh, mix that in there for some flavor. So you can um, experiment a little bit with that. There are a number of recipes out there, and it's actually 
not as bad as it sounds from the very first beginning. Uh, to, to be honest, I think that sounds really tasty. I think I have to find a <laughs> recipe and try this myself. I'm, pro I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm going to find bear meat or bison meat or whatever they put in there. But a bear meat you might find somewhere in Finland. Yeah, uh, there, maybe. Or Russia. Uh, you might find it there. Or Greenland uh, polar bear meat. Possibly. It's a bit hard to get by in Germany. But might be anyway, we can Germany, substitute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's... Basically, um, you can use any kind of meat. I would yes. still um, recommend deer. That's like the, the the best for it. But I see a number of recipes using beef, uh, pork, for example. Um, so there there are kind of um, of recipes out there which you can just check out there. But just remembering the the situation the explorers have been in, very limited provisions, very limited um, selection of food. Pamekin really was kind of a thing that was a specialty. That was really something that cheered up um, people in the field. And that's uh, pretty something special. Very cool. So that brings us almost to the end of this episode. But um, a while ago, we introduced a new concept, our picks of the week, something that... <laughs> That each of us likes something that each of us uh, has been using or found this week um, doesn't necessarily have to do anything with the polar things. But um, I found something that is Christmas related and uh, well, it's not really Christmas related. It's something that makes sounds that are Christmas related and <laughs> it is a little bell and listen to this beautiful sound. And it keeps going for a long time. I brought, I brought this from the Himalayas, so it's not really Christmas related. It's more of a Tibetan Buddhist kind of thing. But still, um, it's my favorite little bell. And I think it just adds a bit to use the it? Christmas mood. For Christmas? Yeah. Or for anything else? No, not really. And it just, just hangs out here. And every now and then I pick it up and I ring it and it makes me feel good. So... That was my pick of the week. You have another pick of the week. Yeah, I'm a totally uh, freak when it comes to tea. So I'm, I'm really addicted to tea. I'm not drinking any coffee or any alcohol. So my um, addiction goes for green tea. Uh -huh. And I really had trouble sometimes in the summers when it was so hot, uh, drinking a hot tea. And that was solved by me exploring cold brew green tea. And mm. I was just really skeptic about that in the first place. Um, you really have to, to, to trust that when you go there to, to Japanese tea dealers, they know what they're talking about. And they came up with a bottle and this bottle has just really changed my life um, with green tea. And I really drink a lot of green tea all day. And to just yeah, change every now and then from just the, the boiled one, I just go to a cold brew one. And even though that here is described as a coffee pot. Yeah, I was just wondering why it says coffee here in the page. It but works it perfectly work with also tea. with green tea. Yeah, you just have um, certain types of green tea which uh, work with a cold brew or as cold brew and for me that's just uh, really delicious and I remember I've done that in summer and uh, showed that to you Chris and you were just very skeptical looking at the the grass um, floating in the water which was indeed green tea I really like it every now and then to just yeah put it overnight in the fridge and uh, have some amazingly chilled green tea in the morning really great otherwise if you boil green tea and you let it stand for a while it turns brown and it doesn't taste good at all anymore it turns bitter and this cold brew completely different because it's not boiled it's just really amazing can stay for days in the fridge really really great wonderful so this yeah cheers and this brings us to the what <clears throat> hold on hold on <laughs> oh look it's snowing again uh, uh, definitely need to put my hat back on because it's getting cold in here. Um, <laughs> this was it for this week's episode, for the Christmas episode. One more this year, and of course we will be 
uh, available on our social media at Curiously Polar on the Twitter, on Insta, and uh, everywhere you find your podcast, you can find this show as well. Um, Happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Exactly. With that, um, have a good one. Make sure to be back in a week. We'll be back on the 29th. Until then, everyone, take care. 